which brings us to episode 50. Woohoo! Starting an online business can be a lonely ride, especially when you're trying to change the world one day at a time. But you're home now in a place where inspiration flows thick and fast, and we arm you with the how-tos to get started, grow, and thrive in business. Welcome to the Wellness Entrepreneur Podcast with business coach and trainer, Katie Wyatt. The mission of the show is to simplify online business so you can focus on your mission rather than your marketing because it doesn't have to be that hard. Let's leverage your time so you can have more impact and amplify your message. You are a change maker. We need you loud and clear. Wellness entrepreneurs, passion can change the world and make good business. Hey, party people! I'm so excited. We're at episode 50. That means I have created 50 episodes of this podcast. Can you believe it? I am so pumped. So pumped, so pumped, so pumped. I could I have imagined getting to 50 episodes when I started podcasting? I don't think that I could. And how long has it taken me? It has taken me one year and five months of a fortnightly podcast with a brief period over Christmas 2015 where I was releasing every day for 12 days. 12 days of Podmas. Check it out. I'm, oh my goodness. I know I'm doing like a really crappy Oscars speech now. But what do I want to say about 50? I actually have decided to do a solo show because it's 50 and it's my show. I'm the boss. I get to do that. And I really wanted to, you know, it's been a goal of mine to do more solo shows this year. And I haven't really been kicking that goal. So I thought what better time to start than today and I wanted to share with you pretty much the thing that I gave a keynote on recently at the Artful Business Conference and it also ties in very nicely to the fact that we're at 50 episodes because the topic was the power of consistency. Now it is a theme that has threaded through my podcast for a while now. It is one of these things that I tend to go on about a little bit, but I spent time in preparing for this keynote in really trying to come to a place where I understood the power of consistency beyond just a surface level because I think that we all know rationally that consistency works but do we is that enough is that enough to really get inside our bones and our creative motivation and our tools of the trade is it enough and I think knowing it rationally is not enough you know we know lots of things rationally and that is not enough to make us do them so I wanted to leave people at the end of this particular keynote with that powerful engagement on the inside deep deep down in their gut that was going to make that was really going to switch a switch turn a switch flick a switch for them And, you know, that light bulb would go on and they would go home and choose something to be consistent about. And, you know, I think that it was pretty good. Um, I, you know, there's been a lot of Facebook tagging of me since Artful of people that have a renewed vigor and commitment to consistency and a couple of things that really helped people come to terms with that and for it to feel like something they could do. And so I wanted to share it with you guys because you're my, you're my peeps. You are my favorite people in the world that listen to this podcast week in, week out. Well, fortnight in fortnight out 
And so this is the this solo show is called On Consistency, Katie White on Consistency. And uh, hopefully it is just the beginning of more solo shows where I share my insights and hopefully little flashes of brilliance with you in a way that hopefully enables you to make change and take action in your own business and life. So without further ado, let us talk about the power of consistency. Let me start, I want to start with a story about a boy called Huge. Now Huge was a pretty cute boy, he really was. He, that is not the reason I'm telling the story, but it's kind of relevant. So it's 2001, I know we're going back a little way, and I was living in Sydney, I was working for a really big consulting company at the time, and I met this boy called Huge, and he was a bit of a babe, and he lived in, I think he lived in Bondi or Tamarama, one of those, if you know Sydney, it's one of the gorgeous Sydney beaches fairly close to the city. And he loved to surf. He loved the beach and the waves and he also loved taking photographs. So when I met him, he told me about this thing that he did every morning at 5am. He'd go to the beach, he'd have a surf and he'd take a photo and then he'd send that photo and a little update on the surf, his little surf report out to his friends and he added me to that list. It was just a little list of people that were interested in getting these daily surf reports. And no, I don't surf, but he was cute. And we'll, I'll come back to you, Joe. will just put that one to the side, but I will come back, I promise. First of all, what I want to say is I, I know that when I talk about consistency, I know that it can cause some people to cringe and I know that it creates guilt, okay? I've posted about it in Facebook enough to know how guilty people feel about the email list that they don't email or weekly blog posts that just don't get published. And so, but I want to ask you, I know, no, I don't even want to ask you, I don't need to ask you because I know that you already wish that you were more consistent in the things that you do in your business or your personal life. And I'm the reason I know that is because I feel the same. So what I'm not doing here is telling you that I am consistent at everything. I'm not. I am probably the most inconsistent person that I know. Uh, And that's okay because the point is that I actually, the power of consistency is not about doing everything consistently. It can simply be, and the power is in it, simply being about one thing. And I will come back to that too. I want to change tack and ask you if you know what it is that you're afraid of in business. I think that we as a tribe, the wellness entrepreneur tribe, the people that I meet and network with in this online world, we are pretty well versed in fears and mindset because we're mostly women and we're entrepreneurs and it doesn't really get more highly evolved than that. I always thought when I started my business that my fear was of failure and it's really hard you know, to connect with that word because the words that once meant so much, we use them so much that they can lose their meaning. So I had to really sit with this for a while to get to the heart of what that fear of failure really meant. So I thought it meant, you know, walking down the street naked type of embarrassing, epic, bankruptcy, catastrophic front page of the newspaper type of failure. But actually, it, you know, how likely is that big type of failure unless you're like embezzling people's 
money or something, (laughs) which I'm not doing. And I actually realized that the fear was about going unnoticed, that I would launch this podcast, I would start a business and it would just be ignored. It would mean nothing like, you know, we talk about the stones that fall and create ripples in the pond. And this was one of those stones that just fell to the bottom without a ripple and that there would be nothing epic about me or my business at all. I started my business after I lost a baby and it was like a funnel. Any, You may understand this. It was like a funnel for all of that energy and the time that I'd already allotted to a baby that was never going to come. So I needed to put it somewhere and so I started selling superfoods online. But the dream of starting a business had been there for a long time and it had been particularly burning inside after I had cancer the first time. And for anyone that's experienced what, you know, one of those major transitions in their lives, and I know that most of my audience are at an age where they've probably experienced at least one major transition in their life, whether it's cancer or childbirth or losing a parent or losing a friend or getting married, you know, that moment when everything before feels like it was before the event with capital letters and everything after is after the event and that becomes that real split or defining moment in your life journey and for me that was cancer the first time and I remember when the chemo was over and the immediate risk to my health had passed and I returned to work and my life was you know, kind of back to normal. And that was all I'd wanted for months. And yet I felt empty. I remember saying to Vic, one of my closest friends, I feel like there must be something more. I felt like I was wasting this gift that had been given back to me. And that was that little inkling of emptiness has stayed with me for the 10 years since. And what I was scared of was that I could have died and I almost did and I would not have left the world a better place, in my opinion. I wouldn't have been noticed coming through this life. And I asked about this in my Facebook group, if anyone else has felt this way about their lives, and apparently people do, but only like 99% of the time. And that fear of being missed in the crowd and not making the impact that I know I'm capable of, I realized was so at odds with how I wanted to feel about my life, how I expected to feel about my life and the mark I was going to make on the world. I ached for a legacy. I ached for recognition and I ached to be noticed. And I think that if you have embarked on this entrepreneurial journey that potentially you have ached for similar things as well. And yes, that's an awful lot of pressure to put on a business and starting a business, like survive cancer, start a business, lose a baby, start a business. I know it's a lot of pressure, but I think what we find when we start a business like what many of us have, is becomes this major personal development journey. And that is where all of these realisations come to the fore. And so I had that fear, you know, but obviously somewhere along the way I still started my business. I started my podcast, I put my big girl pants on and I started a business. But let's, you know, Just going back to huge for a minute, every day I got those daily surf reports and it was just a little paragraph on the weather and the waves and a beautiful photo every single day. We were in our 20s. He was not going to bed at 7pm so that he could get up to take that photo. In fact, I'm sure there were days when he went or nights when he went straight from the bar or the club to the beach, but still every single day. And eventually in 2002, he started a proper blog, probably, you know, back in the day when I didn't even know what a blog was. And in 2015, I started a podcast. And somewhere in between, before or after, you have all started something too. But what could have happened? 
Huge could have decided that partying was more fun or his corporate career was all consuming and was going to be his focus and that's where the money was and I could have decided to stop podcasting. It was costing me money. I wasn't making any money in my business at that point. In fact, I didn't even have my current business at that point. What about you? What could you or have you let go of because of lack of time or you're balancing mamahood and a business get a bit boring (laughs) it felt like it just wasn't intuitive or meant to be anymore or it wasn't having results I got a message from a former podcaster the other day and she said to me 22 episodes I did 22 episodes and I gave it up because it wasn't generating any ROI or return on investment. I offered her some feedback as to, because I can't help myself, as to why it might not be reaching her tribe. And she agreed with me, but she said, I've done 22 episodes though. And she was so burned out by the feeling that they'd failed, those episodes had failed, She just had no energy left to try again. And I get that. We've all got stories like that on our business, on our business path. I mean, I left behind an entire business, right? Although I did still get to eat the cacao powder that I had left. And somehow even being imperfect and flawed, I started a podcast and I've podcasted consistently for what did I just say it had been, 18, 17, 18 months, every fortnight, bar one, rain, hail or shine. And so, as I said in the intro, what I decided to do was dissect what made me able to be consistent at that thing and what made others able to be consistent at the things that they do. So what makes somebody like Tash Corbin able to build a Facebook group of 10,000 as fast as she has, um, if you know Tash Corbin, who has been a guest on the podcast, or Elle Roberts, my collaborator and biz friend who has, you know, stuck with a selfie a day challenge for over a year and huge, you know, what made him able to get out of bed every morning at 5am to photograph the beach for all those wannabe city workers who were reading that surf report with no chance of ever actually surfing in it. What made me able to produce a podcast over and over again, even though I felt embarrassed and stupid, like I have a voice for writing. And I found four things that really certainly helped. Hey y'all, I just wanted to jump in here during Katie's 50th episode. And yes, this is Katie talking about Katie in the third person. Hashtag a little bit weird. But I wanted to tell you that episode 50 is brought to you by the Melbourne Maven series. Are you an entrepreneur or lady boss or dreampreneur who is located in Melbourne? Would you love to connect with some like-minded lady bosses, but the thought of making small talk at a big faceless event is, well, frankly, somewhere between terrifying and nose bleeding. Well, the Melbourne Maven series is in-person masterminds for only six women just like you. You will form new connections, get support and ideas in your business and laser coaching from me all over excellent coffee and beautiful snacks. The first one is on Wednesday, June 29th at 10.30 a.m. and will be at a cozy cafe in the Malvern East Glen Huntley area. It's only $100 and that includes the coffee, which is totally the cheapest way to get business coaching from me, aside from this podcast, and it comes with hugs too. So if you think this sounds like you, book in and join me at bit.ly forward slash melbmaven, M-E-L-B, M-A-V-E-N or check out the workshops page under the work with me tab on my website. Let's get back to episode 50. And that's what I want to talk to you about. One is restriction. So restriction, 
have it like if you've ever and I know because you're wellnessy that you've probably done this you've put yourself on a really restricted diet maybe you've had to because you've had health issues and suddenly by restricting what you're what is available to you you suddenly created dishes that you didn't even know were possible for you or like last year um i went to artful business conference last year and a gorgeous woman called sonia lynn who has a business called dandelion talked about the creativity that comes from having the restriction of this tiny little canvas she makes these beautiful tiny little embroidery hoops that people can buy and embroider uh, but they're tiny so you kind of have this really limited canvas so I, what I want to suggest to you is how can you create more restriction? And the way that we can do that is to focus on one thing. And I did tell you we'd come back to the one thing. There is power in one. It makes you focused. It makes you specific. It makes you like a laser. And frankly, one thing is easier to stick to than five things. Multitasking does not work. That has been disproven. I was able to be a consistent podcaster because I wasn't trying to be a consistent blogger. I wasn't trying to be a consistent vlogger on YouTube. So ask yourself, is your consistency being sabotaged by your own over-optimistic commitment to too many things? Go on, raise your hand and say yes. <laughs> Thereby, I give you permission to shred to offload, to discard and shrug off those best laid plants and get intimate with just one thing. And restriction has a sister and her name is reduced decision making. So did you know, I did not know this until I was researching for my keynote, but we make an average, on average more than 35,000 decisions every day and around 200 of those are decisions about food. That is a lot of decisions for what is supposedly three meals a day. How exhausting and draining. And, you know, I'm already somebody that struggles with small decisions. A decision to buy a house, sure, I'll do that on a, on a wing and a prayer and a weekend. What to have for lunch, I'll ponder, I'll wonder, I'll scenario plan and I'll avoid making the decision. Like decision procrastination is a thing. Well, guess what? It's also intruding on our ability to be creative and consistent in our business because it's taking energy in our minds. So here's the rules. Make decisions fast because even the wrong decision is better for your brain than a decision deferred. Secondly, look for ways to reduce the decisions that you need to make each day. Like you may not ever make a dent in that 35,000, but you can pick some regular things that you do and take the decision out of it. Steve Jobs famously wore the same suit every day. No decisions about wardrobe. Mark Zuckerberg also does this and you know, that neither of, well, Steve's not doing so well, but Mark Zuckerberg not doing so badly. Tim Ferriss has the same breakfast every day. I wish I could have the same breakfast every day. There's absolutely no chance I could do that. But Tim does it. Barack Obama has only three responses that he uses when he's responding to low priority emails, and that's agree, disagree, or discuss. So where can you restrict your energy from flowing away because you don't have a decision to make? For me, I don't make a decision about whether to do a podcast each fortnight. I just do it. I already made that decision to podcast, so I don't need to make it again. Think about how huge restricted himself. He didn't take a photo at sunset. He didn't branch out and do something else. He just took a photo every sunrise at the beach. No decision, just action. The second step on this little pathway to consistency is structure. So like we're like toddlers entrepreneurs, we really are. We work well in routine and structure. Whether you agree with this or not, structure begets efficiency and efficiency begets productivity. And like peas and carrots and Forrest and Jenny, restriction and structure are really great bedfellows. So let's have a look at John Lee Dumas, who is a like the godfather, not the godfather of podcasting. That's a really bad way to term it. He's just like super, super man of podcasting. 
So he wanted he was wanted to start an, a podcast for entrepreneurs, but he wanted to stand out from the crowd. And he thought every other podcast is doing weekly shows. I'm going to do a daily show seven days a week. And so he restricted himself to a daily show and nothing else and gave himself the same set of questions to ask every interviewee. And he also created a structure because that does not happen on a wing and a prayer that requires structure and efficiency. So I believe he, every Friday, he or one day a week, he records all of his episodes for a week. Peas and carrots, you see? Next is feedback and results. So I recently learned about Gretchen Rubin's four habits of four types of habit forming tendencies. And it's really cool if you a link to something to tell you more about it in the show notes. But if you haven't heard of these before, there's four types that she talks about. One is upholders who respond readily to outer and inner expectations. So these people are generally quite annoying because when they say they're going to do something, they just do it. And whether that's because someone expects them to or because they just decided to. Questioners, and I feel like we're all married to one of these. I am. Questioners question all expectations. So they'll meet an expectation if they think it makes sense, but they need to be proven that it, you know, they have proven to them that it makes sense. Then rebels are those that resist all expectations, both outer and inner. So they're just, con you know, constantly annoying themselves and probably other people around them. There's not a lot of rebels in the world. I happen to know and love a rebel um, very much, so I shouldn't be mean about them. But seriously, and then most of us are obligers. Actually, most of us are obligers or questioners, um, but obligers, I like obligers because that's what I am. Uh, they meet outer expectations but struggle to meet expectations they impose on themselves. So most people, according to Gretchen, are obligers or questioners. I'm an obliger. What it means is I'm really good at having external, responding to external accountability. So if I need to get feedback on things um, that I want to be consistent about, it helps me. So for a podcaster, the joy of being able to track downloads is like catnip to our, our sub obligers. And I also use outsourcing and team basically of like I outsource components of the podcast so that it forces me to stick to a deadline. Next is fun. And this is where I bring the sexy back to consistency because consistency can be sexy. And what that is all about is I give you permission to let go of what you should be consistent at. I give you permission to say, sure, you made millions of Facebook ads, but I'm not doing that yet. Or really, I can build a six-figure business off Periscope, but sorry, what's Periscope again? I give you permission to choose not to do a course about podcasting even though I have a brilliant one. I give you permission to choose not to learn some other thing that someone's selling you about your business because it just doesn't light you up. <sighs> I give you permission. But what you've got to choose what does light you up and you've got to choose what feels fun and easy and flowing for you and then and walk your own path, but walk it like you mean it. If it's videos, then make videos. If it's podcasting, then podcast. If it's selfies, then take selfies. So what is your fun? What feels sexy to you? It won't always feel sexy. Sometimes it will just feel like hard work, but it's got to start in a really fun place. And I'm sure that there's somebody listening to me right now thinking I work intuitively and therefore I can't schedule myself into being consistent because it just removes the intuition and the inspiration from that process. So I want to introduce you to somebody that we will call Ellen. And she, we had a conversation recently um, and you know, she's a real manifester. So she's very anti-structure and anti-consistent content creation. She 
just does not work in that space at all and she fights it um, all of the way, yet she's very, very successful. And so I was having a chat to her because I felt like, well, I have this theory that consistency is the thing that works. So how can she be so successful from being so inconsistent with any of the usual stuff? And so while we were talking about it, uh, what I realized was that for what I teach about consistency and what I rant about on consistency is the mirror image of what she talks about when she talks about manifesting. We're just coming at it from different sides of the brain. So consistency is how you manifest. The first teaching of those who teach manifesting is not just about consciously setting intentions and working on limiting beliefs and changing your, your energy fields and consciously attracting abundance and the things that you want into your life, but it's also about doing that as a regular practice, which means you're being authentically consistent and that you will therefore manifest the things that you are regularly, consistently visualizing and bringing into being in your life. So if that is how you work, is setting intentions and conscious spiritual communication, then be consistent about it. I'm sure you already are. You just probably haven't even recognized that about yourself. <sighs> okay, I'm ranting, but let's come back to huge. So the re I didn't just mention him because I think he's a babe, but what I wanted to show or tell you about was what happened next. So if we fast forward to today, Huge, that blog has become Huge's business. So he now has 43,000 people subscribed to his daily emails that are dedicated to early morning beach life. He has turned that early morning surf photography into his career. He has a gallery in Bondi Beach. This, you know, it took on a life of its own. It went into a direction that he could never have imagined, but only because he gave it the gift of consistency. And what about me? You know, I've podcasted every fortnight for 17, 18 months except for one. And when I missed that one, I got emails from people that I didn't know asking me where it was. And I realized I was a regular in their life. I was wanted. I was noticed. And to turn it all on its head, what I wanted to reference is the godfather of marketing, Mr. Seth Godin, who said that the only thing that we as humans are consistent at is being inconsistent. And he says that we tell ourselves every situation is a special one and that is how we justify our own inconsistency to ourselves. And he's right, which is why being consistent at everything doesn't work. It's why just one thing. <laughs> so I invite you to embrace and accept the fact that most of the time, yes, our paths are just a, a litany of juxtapositions and contradictions and oppositions and inconsistencies and holes that a lawyer could drive a truck through. And I invite you to pick just one thing and play with it, be consistent with it in a way that feels fun and sexy to you and do it over and over again and then do it some more. Do it for a year and then come and tell me if it doesn't work. That is what Katie Wyatt has to say on the topic of, of consistency. I almost said inconsistency. On the topic of consistency, I hope that it has something in there has resonated with you and something in there has made your tummy sit up a little bit straighter and think about something that you can implement in your business right now, today, this afternoon. If you enjoyed this episode, please let me know because I would like to do more solo shows, but the fact is that I don't. But if I had a little bit of external accountability or feedback, then perhaps I would start. So please let me know. I like to be hit up all over social media, uh, particularly in my Facebook group, Wellness Entrepreneurs, where we start, grow, thrive. Come and join me. And that is all for this week. 
I will be back in a fortnight with another fabulous episode of this gorgeous podcast and will be number 51. Have a great week.